It's an absolute pleasure to have our special guest speakers here today. Um, and an honour to introduce uh, our diverse presentations today. I'll start with our first pres presenter, uh, who is Arifa. She's a diary speaking Afghan lady. She talks about her experience in caring for her father with mental health issues. A number of years after their arrival, her father was diagnosed with anxiety and depression. Arifa and her family cared for their father throughout these episodes. She shares her experience from the lens of a daughter. And joining Arifa today, we have Sharon, who will be assisting with interpreting, and Silvana, who will be co-facilitating with Arifa. Can I welcome you through to the stage? Conversations, and then we filmed it, and then we tried to edit it in English, which is interesting. 
Uh, so therefore we didn't lose money. So we have a lot of project partners uh, who all came along the board bit by bit. But so for, for me, the care of films are not about they're not about these organisations. These organisations have created the money and the opportunity in order for these people She's a woman from Turkey, also refugee journey, a <coughs> primary carer for her daughter. So this is Amina, primary carer for her brother. Also, refugee journey, mother, social worker. This is Saeed from Egypt, father, primary carer for his wife and his two adult children. Engineer, interpreter. shortly. Not all the carers could come with us today, so we thought it was important to actually have the carers profile rather than the organisations that funded the project. Uh, this film is their film, is their films, it has their films, is their conversations, it's their stories. And um, in the making of the films, we had a very tight and intimate production crew and um, uh, when we had the conversations, it went over a period of five days, different carer each day, different house, and a deep intimacy, eight to 10 hours with each carer each day. And so in summary, so we put together some pictures that for us uh, evoke, were evoked in the conversations. We could have a PowerPoint with lots of dot points and slides, but we've chosen to spare everybody that one. And so they so generously offered all of their stories as awareness raising, and I strongly recommend you look at the other ones. So for us, those pictures kind of captured uh, all the different insights that people shared with us 
because sometimes uh, words are deeply inadequate for the emotional and body experiences that people have. These are the common themes. And I think something that stood out in all of the narratives, all of the explorations that we had was that the carers were so incredibly generous with wanting to help others, to show others, to share their stories. And they talked as well as the difficulties, the barriers, the complexities, there was a lot of conversation about love and about connection and about the profound um, gift and benefit of being able to assist somebody. Uh, and these, we thought, were things that really needed to be respected and honoured. And this is something that was something that Aretha actually said to me. Uh, which then when everything was translated, I thought, wow, that's just really beautiful. And that's what we are, we're beacons for each other. So, <coughs> I'm just gonna go straight to Aretha's film. Yes, please. Have you done all of the... Oh, no, okay. It's okay because I've got it. Oh, okay. No. I'm just going to ask that. I'm 
که هیچ چیز نیست همه چیز سعیز اما پدر ما ایچ وقت قبول نمیکن به خطر که ایره بسیار که پریشان قوی گرفته بود پدر ما تا بالاخره ما پدر خدا رو به شفاقانه بودیم به اونجا بستر شد و راستی قوی ترین دوا رو به پدر ما می دادم تا که بالاخره پدر ما با یک حالت یفتید که می گفت در زیر خانه شاید یک ماشین ها روشن باشه اینا در جان ما می آیا حال من عذیت می کنند اما باز ما و قیم روستی پدر مشافه خانه را ما احساس بسیار پرایشانی میکردیم احساس یزی را میکردیم که ما زبان را نمی کنیم و واقعا بعضی وقتا که دکتر ها بر پدر ما دوا میداد این روستی است دوا میداد پدر را میداد که این دوا است که من را یا میتن که من باید بمرون من را میکشم و ما بر اجزاری میکردیم که این دوا بر از این است این خوبت میکنم اما بازم پدر می رو راستی واقعا بسیار برای ما یک چیز نازوی بسیار جگر خونی بود که ساتا می ششتیم در باریز فکر می کردیم که پدرم فرزن چرا یک فکر می کنه و ما راستی زبان را نمی فهمیدیم این بسیار برای ما مشکل بود بسیار که حال او روزا باید ما باید ما بسیار راستی احساس پرشانی می کنیم و همچنین ما نمی تانستیم که برای مردم دیگه همی چیزی که به فامیل ما بوده ما باید مردم دیگر بویم که پدر میلیت تکلیف داره این ما به شفاق خانه بردیم ما هیچ وقتی این از, از زبان خود از قلب خود بیرون کده نمیدونیسیم و همه فشار, فشار برای خود میاردیم اما ما این فشار سر خود میرفتیم برای مردم هیچ وقت نمیگفتیم قصه میکنم و البته می کتاب ما قرآن شریف که سورا میخوانه و می دعایی که میکنه و بعد از اون دعوای زیاد قوی که میخوانی دعوای زیاد بلاخره بسیار کم شده را که حال فضل خدا اما برش امی بسیار تاثیر مزبط کرد امی دعا ها امی خواهندن کتاب ما قرآن شریف کنش واقعا دین ما به ما بسیار کمک کرد در ایسه اترام به پدر و مادر اترام به همه کس و, و به کتاب ما نشته شده که کس نمیتونه در مقابل پدر و مادر خود یک آه بگوید فرزن پدر و مادر سر آدم فشار بره تو یک صدای بلند سر پدر و مادر بگوید باید نگوید باید به با پدر و مادر بسیار میروان باشید و راستی واقعا پدر مادر ما هر قدر با پدر کمک کرد خدا هم به ما همی اوصله داد استقامت داد و ای امی دین ما بخاطر که مشکل به پیش ما میره ما پیش خدا کمک میخوایم خدا هم به همه کس کمک میکنه اما کس که به او فرزن بخواید کمک بخواید پیشش یک روز برش کمک میکنه و دادش میرسه ولی من منعیست که یک افغان اگر مشکل خدا بین مردم میگفتم مردم سرمه شاید رشخم میزدن مسقره میکردن و پدر من رو بایسته خدا نخواسته بایسته یک دیوانه میشموردن که یک دیوانه است اما فشار که سر ما بود ما برای هیچ کس نمیگفتیم میخواستیم که این مسائل اما بین خود ما حل شود و ما این برای کمونیتی حالا میگیم این فرزن با استرالیا جای شرم نیست استرالیا مملکت است که فرزن امی مشکلات ها داره اگر در مملکت ما نبود شرماور بود اما در اینجا مردم به کمکش میبروید مرجعه هاست که برای کمک میکنن و ما به این بسیار خوش هستیم فرزن اول کمک فامیل باز و کمک مرجعه هایی که برای کمک میکنن ما از این کارشون بسیار خوش هستیم و یک نتیجه خوب گرفتیم بله ما اما قدر می روید کنی ایچ وقت آدم امی امیدواری را قطع نکنه به زندگی خود امیشه امیدوار باشد بخاطر که امی امید آدم را به یک جای می رسانم به یک جای مزبط می رسانم و ما همه چیز سر پدر خود تبدیل کردیم
have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, so She says to, uh, to translate or interpret this very difficult poem, but without the interpreting, I would like to recite the poem in my own language. This is for my father. Can, can we just one, yeah. one second? <coughs> um, maybe we'll do the question because, yeah, yeah. we can have some questions at the end. Okay. Or do you want to do questions, a couple of questions now? What do you yeah, prefer? No, okay. it's up to you. Yes, one question. Yes, one. Are you this one or just like We would like you to read it, but okay. if we do a few questions first and then read, or read. Yeah, the questions well, read and then. You read. Okay. <coughs> Yes, my father really liked this book, this uh, poetry, and this poetry really uh, helped. Mm -hmm. uh, the poem is Shams uh, Tabrizi. Rumi, maybe you have heard about the poem Rumi. This is some of his very interesting points. Nagustamat Maravonjo ke Oshno Mana. Darin Sarobe Fano Chashmai Halo Mana. Wagar Wagar Bahash Mravi Sat Hazor Sol Zeman. Ba Okubat Bamanoi Muntaho Mana. نگفتمت که به نقش جهان مش و رازی که نقش بند سر و پرده رضا منم نگفتمت که منم بحر و تو یکی ماهی مرا و بخوش که دریای با سفاق منم نگفتمت که چمران به سوی دام مرا بیا که قوت پرواز و پر و پاک منم نگفتمت که تو را رزنند و سرد کنند که آتش و طبش و گرمی هوا منم نگفتمت که صفت های زشت در پینه هم که گم کنی که سرچشمه صفات منم نگفتمت که مرا کار بنده از چی جهت نظام گیرد و خلاق جهات منم اگر چرا دلی دان که راه خانه کجاست اگر چرا دلی دان که راه خانه کجاست اگر خدا و اگر خدا صفتی دان که تر خدا من Like the 
is empowering culturally and linguistically diverse communities and people like yourself or in situations like yourself to access our health services. Yes, that is wonderful. I, I was wondering if you had any ideas how we can make that better for culturally and linguistically diverse communities. And as I show on, what you can do to me, you must allow me to be careful of me, but I'm joking to you, I think that I'm going to try to do that. Good. Maybe I'm going to try to do that. Forces, we don't have to make them under a different material transition. Cat is present if you want to know the government, it doesn't matter. It's not like I'm going to do it. I mean, it's not like I'm going to do it. Here, we're not going to do it. We're going to do it. One of the most important and the simplest way is to actually communicate with the community of non-English background, for example, the Farsi language, and let them know that the services are available so they feel confident to come and seek help in such big uh, establishments. Mm -hmm. Is there a best way to do that? For example, there are a number of Afghan communities in Melbourne, groups, associations, that we can go to them and say to them that we are here to help, especially in the area of mental health. If you have any problems, you can come and get help. There is a, a association or an organization in Preston that helps people with mental health and the Afghan people seek help there because they know there is such a and the person who runs the program, Mr. Shabbos, Mrs. Uh, Shabbos, uh, the community know her and trust her, and that is probably one of the reasons that they seek help. For example, on Thursdays, we get together, we uh, talk about different health issues, different community issues, they take us out in, we spend time together, it is really good for our um, well-being to have such gatherings and uh, they also invite others from the wider community to come and talk to us about the health issues. Yes, it happens on Thursdays. Can I, can I yes, tie yes, in there? Yes, yes. It's so, and great if you can interpret too, the, the thing about this project is that we are beautifully unscripted. Uh, we weren't scripted in making the films and we're not scripted when we go out and talk because we really want people to speak their own message and speak their own truth. 
So why was I blaming myself for my son's, my son's illness? Thankfully, the blame passed as I relieved these memories. Now, I'm going to read you a few extracts from a book, Shedding the Black Coat. These are all for my children. Evie, number one daughter. As sick as Perry is, none of us ask why. There are no favourites in our family, no judgments. They have just not happened. They have been some very difficult incidents, but we have managed all these together. Our family is functional. So in dealing with the illness, we've been open for understanding, learning and working together without neglecting our own families. Mimi, number two daughter. By osmosis, we have grown to believe that family is more important than anything. Unconditional love is at the centre. We will always support. There is no favouritism. My parents always focused on the one with a need. That's the way our parents brought us up, putting family above everything. John, number one son. Perry's instincts and behaviours are deeply embedded in all of us and the family comes together to deal with his issues. Our father, a Greek migrant, was a wonderful gentleman and musician with a great sense of humour. The way I see things is the following. Kurt Vonnegut, an author, wrote the following in one of his books about a character with a mental illness. He explains, something crawled into his ear and ate the wiring. That's what happened with my brother. The wiring is damaged. Platon, number two son. The beautiful thing about my brother is that there is no jealousy ever. He's proud of our families. Perry was a very good sportsman. He was always competitive and played football even with his illness. I'm very proud of him. To anyone facing the illness of a relative, be there, be understanding. Also think yourself lucky because you can step out and breathe. I will always be there to support. Perry, number three son. I have an illness called schizophrenia. I hear voices. I have had them all day since 1984. They are always there, but with medication they are manageable. I have learned how to relax and can now see that what the voices say isn't true. Schizophrenia has ruined my life. I've tried working, but my symptoms increased. I love my family and I'm not jealous of them. I remember Dad. He was a good man. He was eight. When I was 18, I started learning the guitar. Dad taught me. For 12 long years, medications were ineffective. One day, he left home, compelled to act out his delusions. I am eternally grateful to his treating team and my family who responded in a way that averted a tragedy. A change of medication was prescribed and when he eventually was discharged from the hospital, his dad drove him home. During the drive, he looked out the window. These buildings are magnificent and the trees are so green. Dad, I can breathe again. Arrive, arriving home, he slowly walked towards me, hugged me and smiling, he said, I'm home, Mum. I had waited 12 long years to feel his love again. The whole family breathed again. We said goodbye to the person who existed before schizophrenia came onto the scene and greeted and accepted the new person who has emerged. As a family, we have healed. In 2000, I was appoint appointed a care consultant at the Northwest Area Mental Health. It's pleasing to know that consumer and care consultants now working at most of the mental health services and hospitals. Our experiences are special. The question asked today, are we there yet? To answer this question, I will concentrate on the family, family carer position in mental health. It is now written in policy that the care of family be included in the treatment plan. So congratulations to the Alfred staff for accepting this policy of inclusion. Carers I have met recently have experienced changes of attitude compared with how they were ignored at the start of their relative's illness. Unfortunately, there are still many carers who aren't included. There could be reasons why not. Their relative may have not wanted them to be involved. Confidentiality can cause difficulties. Sensitive techniques may be needed to support these particular families. 
The trauma of witnessing the first episode of the symptoms displayed by a person who has serious mental illness can be indeed very traumatic for a family. This experience needs to be acknowledged by all clinicians who care for their ill person. The carer needs to receive quality guidance through clear communication processes. One of the most difficult things carers experience is how to talk to their ill relative when they are paranoid and delusional. I didn't know how to reply when my son was yelling, you're not my mother, I came from outer space. I kept telling him that's nonsense and that I was indeed his mother. The answer escalated his symptoms. Schizophrenia was the illness we were trying to understand. The following is an example of how my son's case manager <coughs> communicated with me during very difficult times. We had palliative care coming to our home during my husband's illness. She noticed our son's agitation. She gave me very specific strategies how to talk to him, keeping in the loop, including in all discussions within the family, encouraging to take responsibilities that he can cope with. Learning to take responsibilities has been so important to his recovery. Training programs for carers are really important. Over the years, some very good programs have been developed by clinical services. They have been designed to help families learn how to manage their ill relative. Some have stopped. I assume they have stopped because of funding cuts. Attending training programs helped me manage and understand my son's behaviours. I learned that when someone with schizophrenia plays back a stored recording of a life experience, it has insufficient impact on them. So it doesn't influence the way in which they handle the same situation when they encounter it again. At last, I realised why our son kept parking his car in a non-parking spot and being fined so often. It was the illness that caused the problem. We need to understand these things. Many of us try to argue with our person. The strange behaviours cause so many arguments in families and it has, in some circumstances, caused serious incidents to happen. During the many years working with the mental health service, I met many families from all kinds of backgrounds. Many were highly educated, others disadvantaged. However, they all experienced similar problems. Many carers live their lives determined by their cultural and religious backgrounds. Some had English language difficulties. Although many pamphlets are available in different languages, it was interesting to observe the following incident at a psychiatric hospital. As I entered the, the visiting area, I heard Tony, a Spanish father, asking a doctor to tell him how his son was. His son was paranoid and delusional. The doctor gave him a pamphlet. Tony threw the pamphlet on the floor, yelling at the doctor, does this pamphlet tell me how my son is today? One issue that was clearly disturbing the cultural diverse families was the Australian concept of independence. They see it as their responsibility as a family to care for this family member and suggestions that the family should become less involved or that the individual with mental illness should live outside the family home is viewed as challenging the integrity of the family and can be interpreted as an insult to family loyalty. As we don't always understand their beliefs and their understanding of mental illness, it's important that we ask some questions. The consumer may be affected by these beliefs. Asking the carer the following question may be helpful in understanding family dynamics. Would you like me to tell, would you like to tell me what you think caused the illness? Angela's husband George had suffered mental illness for most of his married life. She attended a small group. Her distress was obvious. I can't live with George anymore, he tells me. I'm dead. And I explain that I'm alive. I call for him every day. I talk to my doctor and he gave me tablets. So I take the tablets, but George still tells me I'm dead. Maybe if the doctor explained to Angela the nature of the illness and suggested a strategy would be more helpful. Doctors don't always have to prescribe medication. Angela wasn't clinically distressed. She was frustrated. There was a time when our daughter Mimi was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Her neurologist gave me examples how to manage her conditions and how to communicate with her. 
During this period, Perry was in the early phase of his mental illness and believed I wasn't his mother. I asked the psychiatrist how to reply to him. His answer was, be normal. But my normal wasn't accepted by my little son and his symptoms escalated. It would be great if all services understood that carers need support in their role. When carers feel that case managers were meeting the needs of their loved ones, these carers would be happy to step back. It's when this doesn't happen that they feel they must become more involved and make demands on the service. There are many mentally ill people who are homeless. They may not have families who can care for them. It is we as a society that must demand funding for our people. The first priority is a home, then recovery will follow. We're not there yet. Sometimes when some carers find it difficult to understand symptoms, using metaphors in the explanation is helpful. I use the example of an earthquake, especially when explaining symptoms to families from core communities. <laughs> using humour instead of anger and criticism is a good way for carers to manage stress levels. As a carer, I, motiva I motivated myself by, repeat, by repeating this quote from Nelson Mandela. Don't move my mountain, just give me strength to climb. The last part of my story is called, I welcome you all to my home. And as the story comes to an end, we'll hear the sounds of blind indigenous singer Garamo Hinopingu singing to his papa, father, in the sky. It's my tribute of those of my children to their papa. I welcome you all to my home. The story is about Perry's home and how his family planned and built a unit for him at the back of the family home in Glen Iris. Thirty years have now passed since Perry was diagnosed with schizophrenia. At 54, he has reached a state of recovery that I didn't think would ever happen. His dad would often tell me of the recurring dream he had. Kelly, our boy will manage his life when he's 50. And so it was that on Saturday the 11th of October 2014, Perry moved into his home and we had a family gathering. He cut the ribbon. It was an emotional experience to see him so happy. He showed emotions that I hadn't seen for so many years. The speech he gave was beautiful. His home is called Periata, derived from family tradition, which means Perry's home. As my husband Tatsi and I were in the back of our home during the spring of 2003, we talked about our 56 years of marriage. So many memories. The broad beans were now in flour and I knew it wouldn't be long when the beans would be hard <coughs> and I would cook them in a way that my mother had taught me. However, we both knew that maybe this would be the last crop. <coughs> symptoms, of si symptoms of serious illness were emerging and as always our conversations were about Perry's future. We decided that a unit be built for him on the back half of our home after we died. The day his father died, Perry was the last to say goodbye. He gently stroked his forehead and as his father drifted away, he quietly said, I know you always understood me, Dad. Goodbye. Life moved on and I continued working in the mental health system. Perry was now learning to take responsibilities. After I celebrated my 83rd birthday, I decided that I wanted to see him living in his own home before I died. I now had sufficient money to build. I invited my five children to come for lunch. <coughs> they cooked the kind of food they loved when they were children. It was the chicken, egg and lemon soup. Only this Sunday, their father was not with us. The family all agreed it was the right time to start building the unit. They all wanted to contribute. Platt and the carpenter would design and be responsible for the building. John would take care of the finances and paperwork. Evie and Mimi would take care of choosing fittings and furniture. Perry sat at the end of the table and listened carefully but made no comment. We all knew he would express his thought when he was ready. It may be this evening or maybe next week. We all understood. I was so happy that Sunday. I sat in my comfortable chair and relieved memories. The day Perry and his dad arrived home with a baby goat. The holidays we had at the beach, the children's 